Welcome everyone to the final plenary session of the African Parliamentarians Forum. Once more, I'm Shannon Smith, Director of Engagement and Professor of Practice at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. And it's been my pleasure to moderate these sessions over the last month. Our goals in this program are to together explore the role of parliament in the security sector and to share lessons with one another with counterparts from other countries. We've talked candidly about what happens when theoretical concepts of balance of power meet political reality. We've discussed security oversight from the majority and minority perspectives. We've looked at some broader trends in Africa, such as the relatively high rate of turnover of parliamentarians and some of the factors behind that and some of the consequences of it. We've considered some of the tools of oversight in terms, for example, of monitoring the police and combating corruption. Several of our speakers explored the oversight of security spending in greater depth, a critical function to promote an effective security force and public accountability. This week, for our final discussion plenary and then discussion group tomorrow, we want to discuss communicating with constituents, communities, and civil society about security issues. Communications are essential to both representative democracy and to security and public safety. The importance of communications has become only more apparent during the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19, as has been true of the Ebola outbreaks in recent years, has reinforced the fundamental fact that public health depends upon public trust in officials. And trust cannot suddenly be manufactured in a time of crisis. It has to be built over time. The same is true of public trust in security and security institutions. For systems in which parliaments, parliamentarians represent constituencies directly, members of the legislature are often the most direct bridge between the central government and the citizen. And in all systems, parliamentarians serve that function of the link to the people. It is vitally important that constituents hear from their representatives and about security issues, but it is just important that you hear from them. Similarly, it is important that you hear from people in the affected areas in which you are seeking to govern. This two-way communication is needed beyond direct constituencies. It applies to communities in your countries, especially where there might, might be grievances or conflict that you need to understand from local perspectives. And it applies to civil society organizations that can help organize meetings or provide information from more distant areas. Today, we have two very distinguished speakers who will be guiding us through these issues. Professor E. G. Mabodi and Ms. Majda Elpied. Professor G. Mabodi is co-founder of Afrobarometer and served as its executive director from 2008 to 2019 when he became Afrobarometer's chairman of the board of directors and interim CEO. He is also co-founder and former executive director of the Ghana Center for Democratic Development, CDD Ghana. A former professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Ghana, Lagoon, he has held faculty positions at universities in the United States, including the School of International Service of the American University in Washington, DC, and fellowships at the Center for Democracy, Rule of Law, Development at Stanford University, at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, the U.S. Institute of Peace, and the International Forum for Democratic Development. The professor is also a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences in the U.S. and the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. Ms. Majda Elpied is the resident program director in the Central African Republic and the Democratic Republic of Congo for the International Republican Institute, or IRI. She has worked in the field of parliamentary and political party strengthening for more than a decade. She has in-depth experience implementing programming, implementing democracy programming in Africa, having worked through much of the continent. She implemented several programs focused on increasing women's political empowerment, financial oversight, public outreach, citizen engagement, and other issues. While at the Westminster Foundation for Democracy, she served as the deputy director of the Africa division, and she managed a large EU funded election project in DRC focused on 
party agents in election monitoring in 2018. A native French speaker, she has a BA in journalism and an MA in communication studies from the Institute of Higher Studies and Social Communication in Brussels. She's also completed a program on understanding women's rights at the London School of Economics and has been a guest speaker in, at LSC. Because understanding public opinion is an important element of security, we have asked Professor Jima Bodhi to start our conversation today by presenting a few findings from Afrobarometer's vast body of work. Afrobarometer is a nonpartisan Pan-African research institution that conducts public attitude surveys on democracy, governance, the economy and society in over 30 countries. They publish in both English and French. And you will notice in the syllabus for this week are several suggested articles from Afrobarometer on topics such as perceptions of corruption and young people's views of government. I would also commend to you the work of the International Republican Institute and National Democratic Institute that have been featured in some of our other readings and it also deal with some of these questions of engagement and opinion. Today, we have asked the professor to get us started with a few findings of their work. He has a few slides that you will have already seen by email in both English and French. And we will now turn the um, podium over to the professor. Uh, without further ado, Professor Gema, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Smith. And um, again, uh, thank you to ACSS um, on behalf of the 35 uh, national partner organizations across Africa. Um, that's the Afrobarometers and national partner organizations. And on behalf of the management and board of the Afrobarometer and on my own behalf. It's always a pleasure and a privilege to share findings of, from the Afrobarometer surveys that we have been conducting um, fairly regularly since about 2000. Uh, since the year 2000. Um, and much of the findings that I'll be sharing with you today are from the eighth wave of the survey uh, covering um, 18 countries. And that I mean 18 countries that we uh, have the complete data sets for. Um, we're still working on completing the surveys and cleaning and certifying the data for the remaining 17 countries. Afrobarometer uh, captures data on uh, citizen priorities by asking respondents to identify what they see as the most important problems facing this country that government should address. So please slide four. What you see here is that the two clearly valued policy priorities of ordinary Africans are jobs and health, followed by physical infrastructure, stroke roads, and then education, water, and crime as well as security at roughly, you know, they, they give, uh, but you also know that uh, the proportion of respondents who cite crime and security as their most important priority has significantly risen since 2011, 2013 from 14% to 22%. It's also the case that citation or tendency to cite crime and security as a significant, the most important policy problem um, also differs from country to country. So in Burkina Faso, Quebec, and in, um, in Mali and Nigeria, crime and security are cited among citizens' top three priority challenges. 
and that fewer than one in 10 Sierra Leoneans and Guineans and Malawians and Angolans express concern about crime and security. We should also note that while crime and security, corruption and, and, and management of the economy uh, tend to be higher priorities for urban residents, rural residents are more likely to prioritize infrastructure, water supply, electricity, farming and agriculture. And I encourage you to, uh, to sort of look at the data in its disaggregated form, format in, on, you know, when you get a chance uh, when, so that you get a clearer sense of the differences and the variations per country, uh, per uh, socio-demographic group, uh, per, per whether the country is predominantly rural I mean, and agricultural or predominantly urban and, in, and, set and industrialized somewhat. Now, let's go to slide number five, where we look at the responses, the findings to the questions we ask about feelings of safety, personal safety, uh, freedom from crime, and so on. So we asked our respondents, over the past year, how often, if ever, have you or anyone in your family felt unsafe walking in your neighborhood or feared crime in your own home? And here we find that on the average, one third of citizens in the 18 countries said that they have felt unsafe walking in their neighborhood at least several times in the past year with Gabon, Burkina Faso, and Mali having um, citizens, their citizens frequently express this type of fear. And then almost three in 10 say that they have feared crime in their home or at a they have feared crime in their home at least several times in the past year. We also note that the presence of police stations in the enumeration areas does not seem to affect feelings of insecurity. Uh, we, we, we ask our enumerators to track wet, whether police stations were present in the areas where they conducted the interviews. And when we match the frequency or the reported frequency of police stations in uh, the, you know, the enumeration areas covered in a survey, where we find that uh, the presence of, of, of police stations uh, doesn't have a uh, doesn't seem to have an effect on uh, individuals feeling or the respondents feeling of insecurity. We also know that one third, roughly one third of citizens on the average said they have felt unsafe walking in their neighborhood at least several times in the past year. Again, with Gabon, Burkina Faso, and Mali recording uh, the uh, highest. And almost three in 10 say, said that they have feared crime in, they have feared crime um, in their homes or at least several times in their homes, at least several times in the past year. And again, the presence of police station in the enumeration area areas did not appear to affect feelings of insecurity 
of the residents that were interviewed in that area. Uh, the final set of slides I want to share with you speak to the issue of the degree to which parliamentarians are deemed to be listening to their constituencies and, and, and then the impact of that on the, the effect of that on the uh, feeling and the, and, and the, and the um, acknowledgement that MPs are performing well. So uh, let's move to slide number six. That's the correlation between MPs not listening versus disapproval of uh, MP performance. As you can see from the chart, for most countries, disapproval of the MPs of MPs for performance correlates with a perception that the MP does not listen to what ordinary people have to say. But we also note from the chart that there are um, some outliers, uh, meaning that this is not uniform across countries. And that in a country like Botswana, there is fairly high perception that their MPs don't listen. Nonetheless, disapproval of MP performance in Botswana is generally low. And then in Angola, in Cote d'Ivoire, in Ethiopia, Malawi, and Burkina Faso, there is low perception that there is MPs don't listen. But disapproval of MP performance is very high in those countries. We deem this outliers because for a majority of the countries, definitely a perception that MPs don't listen goes hand in hand with expressions of disapproval of MP performance in that country. Professor, thanks so much. As always, um, a fascinating sort of insights into public opinion um, and perceptions. Um, it is very striking and disturbing that the, the percentage of people citing concerns about crime and security as one of the most important problems in their lives has grown from 14% to 22% um, over the course of the last decade. Uh, could you tell us, um, you mentioned that the, the, and broke down how the survey varies by, by country. And, and I'd also note that, um, of course, there are some countries facing very serious security challenges, which weren't part of that survey. So, so if, if they were, then, then those numbers might've been even uh, uh, more different. But, but you see differences, other kinds of, of differences. Are there differences by age, for example, to older people or young people feel differently or to men or women tend to respond differently to those questions? We do, we do have, uh, it's fairly easy to do the uh, breakdown by sociodemographic characteristics of the respondents. Yes, that uh, we're still uh, in the data gathering mode. So this is sort of the first brush um, analysis very at a very general level, at very macro level, but it's certainly possible to bore down and um, we, we, we can take a look at that subsequently. I don't have them off the top of my head right now. No, we, we were honored to be among the first to see it then. Um, Majda, I know that the International Republican Institute also does polling and interacts with, with, with groups. And you shared me, with me the results of a poll that IRI did in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And it's, it's a public, the results are public and we'll share them with all our participants as well. 
Um, so DRC is an example of a, a very large, very diverse country with a range of challenges. Um, what were some of the findings in the IRI survey and how did, how did that survey reflect the security situation there? Merci beaucoup. Um, Thank you so much, Shannon. Yes, in uh, DRC, we did a national uh, poll in August 2019 on the uh, citizen expectations on the performance or the perception of the new president, uh, the, of a new government. But one of the questions asked was, what is the most important problem that is facing your country? And in the top three, and there are similarities with the uh, study of Afrobarometer, uh, uh, labor, uh, unemployment was the biggest one. And then insecurity was the came in. And we did this study in 26 provinces, and we noted that insecurity came first or second in the eastern part, Kiu, but uh, in the area of Kinshasa, it was about 9%. So there were very large uh, differences. We interviewed from uh, around uh, 2,900 people, uh, women and men. And also what we noted when we presented the study to to different groups, to the international partners. We presented the study to the civil society, to political parties. There was a lot of criticism and reactions, especially from uh, political parties, because there was the tendency also to look at the performance of the uh, deputies and of the government, so members of parliament. So there were a lot of uh, results that were, they were either positive or negative, depending on the region. It's not surprising, but we had a lot of uh, reaction in Kasai on the uh, security situation, also in the East and also uh, regarding corruption. So what I find interesting and very important is that I had suggested that we redo uh, a poll because it's important to be able to make a comparison two, three, four years later, uh, such as did Afrobarometer. Thank you. Thank you. It's 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 very Merci, interesting to hear about that. Um, uh, I had a, a follow-up question now for for both of you. Um, uh, so polling and and surveys can give some insights into public opinion. Um, but I appreciate it if we could talk about why understanding trends in public opinion matters in terms of security and public safety and, and what parliamentarians might be able to do with this knowledge. So Professor, maybe we could start with you about this connection between the, the, the information um, that Afrobarometer and others can present um, and the, the impact it might have on security or what it might reflect about security and what parliamentarians can do with that. Well, I mean, first, before I, 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 I deal with that, on the earlier question you asked about um, whether how the, uh, uh, the, the concerns about crime and security break down sociodemographically, um, a very, sharp uh, colleague uh, overheard it and um, provides an answer uh, thankfully and their response is that it there is no age difference I mean, there's there, there's a bit of there's a bit of gender difference but not age difference um the the the, the question about you no know, so it i think your second question um relates to the importance of um taking the polls of citizens on the, uh, the public on these issues and um, the importance of doing it across time. It's all, you know, it's, it, it basically speaking to the, the, the reality that, that the essential reality and truth that uh, public opinion, public experience, the experiences of citizens 
the evaluations of citizens which we track are not static. They change over time. And so, um, as you saw, I mean, something like unemployment has continued to be the topmost priority um, from for over 10 years now. Then in fact, if you go back to the 20 years or so of Afrobarometer polling, that remains the case. But health, education, infrastructure, they have been um, interchanging. And then you saw that crime and security has risen by over seven, by uh, eight percentage points in 10 years. So it just says that, you know, watch this space, uh, keep checking every once in a while whether things have improved, things have um, stayed the same, or things have gotten worse. Exactly. I think that that the ability to, to look at how public opinion, how things are changing, as you put it, to, to take the public pulse um, repeatedly is, is really important to understand um, how public perceptions are shifting. And I could see that for, for anyone, if you're drafting a national security strategy, for example, it's very important to understand where public priorities lie. Um, because feelings about economic security can, can obviously um, affect people's perceptions as well of physical security or or can affect grievances if, if perceptions of, of government programs um, are seen as unequal for example um Majda, what what do you think um you you have worked in this sector for years with parliamentarians what do you think that the information that is presented when they learn of this kind of data how does it help a parliamentarian do their job what can they do with the information I think that it is very difficult to get to the data in a general way because it is allows MPs, especially those who don't have the occasion to often uh, go on visits to get feedback from them and to be able to then analyze the data. What's important is that there are many questions. There is also lots of sensitization done, awareness raising in certain areas. And so that kind of gives you the uh, possibility to make a snapshot of the situation. But in order to get more information, we should go back to the region because maybe in reality, we don't have enough of information. and. Uh, organizations such as IRI uh, and also like Afro, Afro Barometer, they can give us this type of information. I also think that lots of people they are kind of um, blocked at home because there is infrastructure problem. People don't have access to good roads. And so there is really a need of information and we need uh, to do more surveys. Well, for example, in the Central African Republic, it's very difficult uh, to make those surveys. Uh, and if we are going to do it, then we need to have a partnership with MINUSCA uh, to protect those who are going to collect the information. But I think that there is lots of appetite for this type of survey because that's a possibility to have a debate that also creates a need to know more, and it allows a factual exchange, an exchange of facts. What I also see when there are surveys, that creates lots of questions, new questions. And I think that when you do a surveys for MPs or journalists, that really brings up lots of questions and that stimulates a debate and that's a very good thing. Indeed, debate is, is always most welcome, especially when there's a grounding of, of information that, that everyone can draw on. Maybe let's shift from the question of, of surveys to the bigger question about communicating. Um, and, and it's important that that be, be a two-way street. Um, and in this case, I, I'll, I'll turn to Majda first. Um, based on your experience, um, 
what are some elements of an effective communications and media strategy for a parliamentarian? How can a parliamentarian communicate with the public or with their constituents? Merci. Tout d'abord, uh... thank you. First of all, it is very important to use the social networks because more and more MPs, uh, parliamentarians use these social networks. That's a very good thing. I talked with some MPs uh, prior to coming to this forum just to get some ideas. And it is interesting to note uh, that some find that it's very important important uh, to be close to their base, but also to keep the same number so that people can uh, connect with them easily. And then a very good strategy is to be proactive, not to wait, uh, because, you know, the, uh, there are too many victims in some, in some zone, zones before uh, you can attract the attention. It's also very important to have meetings with different roundtables, with different actors of the communities, um, uh, the traditional uh, heads of the villages. And what is very important is transparency because lots of people do not trust uh, the defense budget, for example. So it is very important to have more transparency and also this will of the members of parliament to give more information and other thing which helps with communication strategy is to have press conferences. I'm going to give you an example. We have an MP, you see, in 2017, we had this person, his name is Sisonga. And this person wanted to talk about the situation in Kasai. So there was a press conference and he used precise words during this press conference. He uh, talked to MUNASCO, so the United Nations mission. And he said that it is important to protect more the civil society, uh, especially uh, the resolution 2348 should be taken into account. And then he talked to the international community because it's an urgency situation uh, in Kasai, and he talked to the press. He said that no instrumentalization should be used uh, with tribes or ethnic uh, groups um, uh, to be used in uh, this type of conflict. And this is very important. You have to have a good uh, communication strategy. And uh, in order to have that, you have to prepare it. And also um, get the right information from the right people what is important and with what works well and this is another example is to try to have different channels uh, you can have uh, television community radios proximity radios we have this uh, in the central african republic for example where people have lots of difficulty to access roads it can be television and i have one mp here who told me that he used television because that way he can reach the diaspora better and he noticed that diaspora has a tendency uh, to have some uh, cliches with regards to the Eastern conflict. And uh, one needs uh, to demantle this, dismantle this. Uh, one has to show them another perspective of the problem. And so it's a good way to use television. And then there is something else. It has nothing to do with uh, the uh, communication strategy, but this has to do more with the means, the financial means. I have an MP who said to me, um, uh, He's very often contacted at 3 or 4 a.m. And then he noticed later that the reason for this was that his constituency, um, they had a better price to use their data on their cell phone at that time. Uh, so he, that, therefore, he received uh, these texts at 3 a.m. because it was less um, it, it, it was easier for the people to do it then because it was not that expensive. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Professor, um, based on your, your work with Alpha Barometer, but also your, your long career as a political scientist, 
what do you think are some of the other elements that, that might be useful for parliamentarians to, to be able to communicate with and both speak to and hear from their constituents? Well, in here, I still, I can only uh, continue to put on my alpha barometer hat because um, I've, I've, I've been wearing it for a while and uh, I think uh, I, I, I don't have too many, I, I don't trust the other hats that I have worn before or may wear, 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 may be wearing even today. Uh, but just to say that I think one insight from the upper meter data I can share with um, Afghan parliamentarians is that um, without doubt, most of our respondents say that they source their information um, on political affairs or public affairs, uh, principally from the um, electronic media, broadcast media specifically, and that's um, television and radio. And that um, newspaper, very few saw the information from newspapers and increasingly uh, the percentage of citizens sourcing their, um, their uh, information from uh, news from, um, from social media is rising. It's rising exponentially from um, uh, WhatsApp messages from, um, and even from it from the internet is rising. So uh, those are emerging as fairly uh, strong channels for, for communication uh, between the office holders, uh, elect, elected officials and, and, and citizens. Indeed, social media is, uh, um, I think, the, becoming the, the rising vehicle in, in every country. And it's, it's, it's interesting to think about how it can be, a, obviously, another two-way channel um, for, for members of parliament who can, you know, tweet um, about their actions or policy ideas, but also, as, as, you, as Majda mentioned, you know, hold uh, public forums, meetings with individuals and groups. Um, speak on the radio, um, uh, you know, getting their ideas across. But I think it, it's often harder to hear hear from the, the members of the public themselves. Just uh, Chanu, just one point to make, and I will really en encourage um, members of parliamentarians listening you know, who are involved in this program at least to be sure to check uh, their country, um, the our partners, our partners partner institutions in their respective countries for the latest data, um, the latest findings they may have on this, on this, on this sort of issue. Um, and that at least parliamentarians from 35 African countries uh, should be able to get this sort of data um, by the end of July or so. Yes, that's a terrific suggestion, and we we very much encourage um, our participants to do that. And we'll recirculate the some of the this information, and the we will send out a list of, of useful resources to all our participants at the end of the program, and we'll we'll try to include some of those. Um, and uh, and we had a question, a remark that came in in the chat line that critically noted that parliamentarians themselves could use survey data to promote specific legislation or raise an issue on a public event. So if, if for example, that local survey data highlights that, that public concern is, is very important for a particular issue that could certainly then fuel um, uh, a legislative issue, it could help provide support for that. One, uh, one last question before we turn to kind of open question and answer from our, our participants. Um, Majda, in the, the IRI survey of DRC, I, I noticed several trends that women were much more likely than men to say that their country um, was headed in the wrong direction. And this was a survey only in the Democratic Republic of Congo, not more broadly, but, but women were more likely than men to say the country was headed in the wrong direction. Women were more likely to cite insecurity as a top problem. And they were much more pessimistic about the future for young people when they were asked that. Why do you think there was such a strong gender gap? And I wondered if you could give us an example of a best practice 
of how a parliamentarian, especially if the parliamentarian is a man, how can that male parliamentarian reach out to women and hear their views? Oui, merci. Yes, thank you. It is true that um, women express themselves, they were critical and maybe they were more open than men with regards to certain questions. With regards to uh, security questions, sometimes it is difficult to get uh, the opinion of women, especially on uh, some faraway areas. And one of the parliamentarians I, I was talking to said that there were lots of reactions on social networks, on WhatsApp groups, on Facebook, but not many women were expressing themselves. And so discussing together, we thought that it would be a good idea to have a meeting with our women parliamentarians and with leaders of uh, civil society and to open a group with women, a women's group, and to talk profoundly about some issues. I think it always depends uh, on the audience. In big towns like Kinshasa, uh, with regards to civil society, uh, women, uh, they articulate well uh, their ideas. But in uh, the provinces, it's not the case. So we have uh, to work in the context with the different contexts. Sometimes um, it's a, a good idea to share a meal, uh, to establish trust, to have some time to discuss, and also uh, to uh, talk with and to work with good organizations of civil society. Uh, and, these organizations who have already contacts, who are already respected, who are legitimate partners, because in uh, some of those zones, there are so many organizations. It's uh, very, very important to uh, select the good organizations. I talked um, with a friend who said, yes, we need legitimacy, but also for the MPs, uh, because especially MPs who have been elected several times, uh, then they have more trust from the population than others. And sometimes in Congo, for example, there is a journalist, a former journalist, I'm sorry. And she is a parliamentarian since 99, uh, the Honorable Vonga. Uh, she did advocacy before the parliament. So, and, and before, the, so to have a commission of human rights, this is something we didn't have in the past. And this is something which she was synthesizing at the parliament. Um, about she was very active and she was uh, selected as the president. Um, she's very active uh, on social networks. She goes to talk in universities. She's very respected. And she is from Kinshasa. Uh, she is from the neighborhood, which is very popular. And she gets a lot, a lot of information. And she also organizes lots of meetings. Um, but what is very important for me here and what works well is to do this on a regular basis. Uh, the big problem which we have when we ask a question uh, to the citizens and also uh, during the activities with social with civil society, we have lots of interest before elections, lots of visits before elections. So it is all this that doesn't happen on a regular basis. And this is something we have uh, to hold up. We have to make sure that the people, um, that people are heard, that they are listened to on a regular basis. Thank you so much. That's, that's an important point in every political system that if constituents only hear from politicians during elections, that, that does not establish the kind of public trust in, in institutions that then makes the, the, the member a, a trusted voice on security issues. So you both raised some great points about, about public opinion and about communications and its implications for security. And can we I, note, of course, that- Dr. Smith, can I make, can I yes, just please. make one, uh, share a piece of information and that uh, Afrobiometer survey data shows clearly that um, women, I mean, men are twice as likely to contact their parliamentarian than, than men, I mean, than women. And that when um, 
I mean, women tend to um, contact their religious leaders for for uh, about problems that they 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 want um, they want to draw attention to or that needs uh, solving than uh, they they go than than go to par parliamentarians. So there is definitely a challenge there for parliamentarians with respect to making themselves more accessible to to women and also make making making it making women feel more comfortable and um, and and open it making themselves open and making women feel more comfortable that they can access uh, par their own parliamentarians. It's an, an excellent point. And um, uh, one of the ways that, that they might do that is, is um, in addition to trying to convene or meetings with women's organizations, um, male parliamentarians could um, partner with a female parliamentarian um, to hold meetings, for example, um, really try and, and reach people. Um, because these are questions that are important, not just for, for um, you know, the idea of reaching out to women, but the reality is that gender matters to security. Um, and that if, if people experience crime differently, or if they uh, experience um, in other kinds of insecurity differently, um, it, it's important for their members to, to understand and to hear from them on that subject. Um, and we'd note, of course, that the security threats or are, are, challenges are unique in every country. In, in some areas, some countries, that threat may be violent extremism. And, and that's a threat we are seeing in more and more countries in the world. Um, as the professor's data showed us, however, um, people's fears about their personal safety can still be very high in countries that are not experiencing outright conflicts. In every country, then, it becomes important for parliamentarians to serve as this bridge to communities and understand threats as people in diverse communities perceive them. 